if you were to take a height in the Andes Mountains of Peru, you would come across an uh, ancient city set on top of one of the mountains overlooking a large mountain range. And the curiosity of this is, first, how did this city come about up there and what purpose did it serve? It's sitting like a, on a lonely perch up there on the mountains. It's rather interesting. It's one of the great sights to see if you ever do any traveling around the world. In China, a bridge has been stretched out over a ravine. The bridge itself goes for about uh, nine, over 900 feet, and it, it bridges an expanse as a footbridge, and it bridges an expanse uh, of a ravine that plummets down about 600 feet. Now, to begin with, I would not want to walk across any bridge <laughs> over a ravine like that. But this bridge is different. The floor of the bridge is made of one inch plate glass. So that as you step out over the ravine, you see nothing underneath you but the ravine below. And there's a video of folks who are trying to make their way over it, and fear so overcomes them that, that some can hardly make their way. They're holding on to the ropes on the side. They're crawling on their knee, hands and knees as they go a long way. One gentleman is so paralyzed that he just sat there <laughs> could move. Sometimes God's work calls us to walk in faith through deep valleys, through troubled times, towards a distant city, a city that will have life for us. But the journey sometimes is quite paralyzing, quite fearful. Jeremiah looked at his nation and saw the, the vast measure of corruption and the wrath of God that was coming upon his people. And so as a faithful watchman, he, he raised the alarm. He called upon his people to repent. And we've been considering his sermon to uh, his people to that end. Here is a, 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 a powerful, dramatic, uh, very emotional appeal to his home people to repent, to return to the Lord, or face the dramatic, uh, catastrophic consequences of a refusal to repent. We've noted in the structure of, of this sermon that it begins on a very high plane where the Lord reminds the people of their earliest days together, how they were like a, a, a bride with her husband and filled with love and they went anywhere together. But things have fallen apart from there and the Lord confronts His people with their many sins. There's this call to repentance in the... Uh, third chapter, beginning with the 12th verse, that re call to repent is repeated throughout that into the fourth chapter uh, through the fourth verse, where you have the, this tremendous call to God's people to consider their ways, to return to the Lord, and to make a change not simply in outward ways, but to change their hearts. So it must be a genuine change. And then we noted how after that, the prophet brings uh, very vivid warnings from God about the dangers that would ensue should they fail to repent. Now we come to the conclusion of the chapter. And oftentimes with a conclusion, you would expect that perhaps one final story would be told, one uh, dramatic image would be placed upon God's people to drive the point home. But that's not what Jeremiah does here. Indeed, how could you uh, have more dramatic images than what he has already presented of the devastation that the, the armies from the north would create and, and the impact upon uh, all manner of Jewish people, uh, even the most delicate of God's people. And so Jeremiah rather restates the main themes of his argument here in this conclusion. He will first call upon his people to return and to repent, to go back to the ancient ways, back to the ancient paths that were established for them. And then, 
noting their response in something of a, a mock liturgical refrain where the Lord asserts uh, a, a call to them to repent and return. They say, we will not walk in your ways. We will not listen to your word. There's kind of a, a back and forth that God, that God speaks and the congregation responds. And God speaks again, the congregation responds. But this time their response is in rebellion against what God has said. So you have this something of a liturgical setting for the beginning of this section of the sermon. And then the conclusion, okay, you will not hear me? Then hear this, O oh heavens, hear this, O oh earth. And then God declares his judgment upon his people and the reasons for it, grounding it on, on religious reasons. They did not listen to my word. They did not listen to my law. They practiced uh, their religious uh, activities with great devotion outwardly. They went off to distant places to get most expensive incense and, and oils and these kinds of things for their services. But it was all a show. There's no reality there. And then there is the uh, reassertion once more of how God will respond to these folks. I want to take us through these different steps uh, which conclude with the Lord's address to the prophet himself who would be an assayer or one who would test metals to see the value or to try to remove the dross and get to the real value of the ore that is before him. Uh, we want to walk through these things and see how God emphasizes the importance of returning to ancient paths, to the old ways of doing things. And that is an important thing for our modern world to hear, which is so fascinated by anything which is new. It runs after the latest, newest gadget. Witness Apple coming out with their iPhone 6S, and I guess there's a 6S Plus, I don't know this time. <laughs> Wonderful products, but we tend to get over, uh, fascinated by all this new stuff and think that everything that's new is to be accepted, including new ways of morals, new ways of beliefs and thinking about the world. And so we get caught up in all this new stuff that we forget that there's a lot of ancient truths that still need to be at the core of our lives. Some days I get to take my two dogs, Duke and Sam, out walking. We go uh, typically along a path that skirts some wood, a wooded area with a creek hidden in, in, me, in the midst of the woods. And every once in a while I'll take them, to their great delight, into the woods and we'll follow some of the paths that are already presented there in the woods, because that's a whole lot easier, especially when you've got two dogs coming, <laughs> pulling you through. But even the dogs follow the paths. They don't ordinarily just jump off into the, the wooded area and wander along in there. The paths that have already been cleared provide you with safe footing and, and, and a clear passage. But if you leave that path and go off into the woods, well, then you've got fallen trees to manage, you've got uh, uh, thorn bushes and poison ivy and low-hanging branches and all kinds of things to push your way through. There's good reason to follow the ancient paths and the benefit from them. Well, what is Jeremiah referring to? What is the Lord referring to with regard to these ancient paths for his people? Well, I think, again, it echoes the, the very beginning of the sermon where the Lord reminded his, pe his people of their very first days of communion with Him, their fellowship with Him at Mount Sinai and in the wilderness, how they followed Him and served the Lord. And what He's saying here once more is we need to go back. We need to step back to those that ancient covenant that God laid out for His people, which you've received at Mount Sinai, in which you followed him for many years. That was the path to life. That was the path where you had fellowship with the true God. And to leave that path and to go out into the byways of the world, into the forests of the world, and blaze your own path, 
which might seem rather daring and independent, is, is only to bring about your destruction. And interestingly, later on, they'll talk about how the, the Jews would uh, argue or, or tell each other not to go out into the past now because of the destruction that awaited them from the, the marauding armies that were out there. And so you abandon God's ways. You think, I'm not going to walk in this path. I'll go my own way. Well, you end up being frightened from going even your own way because of the dangers God brings into your, into your life. Follow these ancient paths. It's the path of communion with your covenant Lord. We can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when God met with Adam and Eve in the Garden. In the second chapter, you see God fellowshipping with Adam in particular and then with Eve as well as he guides him in the cultivation of the Garden, uh, instructs him with regard to the various trees in the Garden, uh, calls upon Adam to name the various animals, and then finally presents Adam with his wife, Eve. Here was fellowship with God, communion with God. And we saw in the third chapter how that was broken because of their sin by eating the forbidden fruit. And then God comes walking in the garden, much like before, but now rather than being a welcome uh, visit from their Creator, it became a terrifying visit of their judge. And Adam and Eve run and hide from the Lord and cover themselves up. That fellowship was broken. But in His grace, God promised to restore that fellowship. He would drive Adam and Eve out of the garden, but He would clothe them with animal skins and provide them with the promise of a child yet to come to deliver them. And through history, we see God coming to His people, coming, walking with them, as Israel journeyed through the wilderness, the Spirit of God, the glory cloud, walked with the people through the wilderness and brought them along their way till they finally reached Canaan, their inheritance. So God walked with His people by His Spirit. In the New Covenant, we see Jesus walking with His disciples through the mountains and the hillsides of Galilee on to Jerusalem and walking through the streets of Jerusalem up to the temple. And the disciples followed the Lord everywhere He went. And they listened to what He had to say. And they had great covenant fellowship with Him. What an amazing thing it must have been like to walk with their Creator once more, who is now not coming as their judge so much as their Redeemer, their Savior. When he would leave them, he said, I will not leave you as orphans in the world, but he will give you, he will give us his spirit. And his spirit came down upon the disciples at Pentecost, and he dwells within the church. And now we are called upon, as the Apostle Paul says, to walk by the spirit and not carry out the deeds of the flesh. We continue to have this pilgrimage through life, this journey along ancient paths, a journey that is rooted in the word of God, but is in fellowship with God. And by His Spirit, we continue to walk along till we get to that exalted city, a living city, a glorious city that is yet before us. Ancient paths. Sometimes when I think of that as a, a pastor, a theologian, and I'm sure my brethren who are pastors as well will sympathize with this, we think of going back to the ancient paths, we think of going back into the, the great... Uh, libraries of the world and looking through these dusty shelves and pulling out a leather-bound copy of some great work and reading through the ancient uh, theologians, the Puritans of the past, and reminding ourselves of the great truths of the gospel for which they contended. Ancient paths that blazed a trail for the church in God's Word, continuing opening, continually opening up God's Word to us. While we emphasize the importance of ancient paths and following those ancient paths, we are always developing God's Word. One of the uh, uh, cautions that 
one of the commentators made as I was reading this text is that, that we don't just go back to the very elementary things of Scripture and stay there, but we continually unfold that which God has given to us. We're like the, those stewards who have great treasures and we bring out things old and new. And so the Word of God does make progress and we as pastors continue to stretch our understanding of the Scriptures, but it's all always rooted in Scripture. Always grounded in the Word of God. And we are instructed by the, those leather-bound volumes in the libraries that are dust-covered, and we benefit from the traditions of the fathers. But unlike the Roman Catholic tradition, which celebrates the great tradition of the church and elevates it to a position where it becomes authoritative, and really the interpreter of Scripture, we say that Scripture is the final authority, and it interprets tradition. It interprets us. One of the uh, recent memes I've seen, I think you, that's how you interpret it, on Facebook, these little posters that come about that I saw that said, when I read the Bible, I don't criticize the Bible, the Bible criticizes me. The Scriptures are of final authority. And when we ask who is to interpret the Scriptures, we don't look to the church, we don't look to the College of Cardinals or the Holy See, we don't look to tradition, we look to Scripture because Scripture is its own interpreter. And so when we want to, want to go back to the ancient paths, yes, we are benefited by those dusty shelves and the, the, the leather-bound volumes, and we are instructed and taught, but those volumes need to be interpreted and critiqued by Scripture, as do we. Jeremiah places the emphasis on their relationship to God's Word. He goes on later on to talk about how they rejected God's Word, they rejected God's law, they would not listen to God's law. God has given us His Word with clarity. And with authority. And that must be the standard by which we live. That must be the path in which we walk. The prophet is called upon to warn his people from those scriptures, from the standing of the scriptures, and they need to respond. And unfortunately, Jeremiah had to, to go back time and time again and, and point out how they had failed to respond, how they resisted God's Word. Quite a contrast. In Psalm 1, how blessed is, is the man who does not walk in the path of the, of, of the ungodly, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law he meditates day and night. But the wicked here... Of Jeremiah's audience says, we will not walk in your ways. We will not listen to your word. Here is where the great crisis of life meets. In the New International Version, it says, ask about the, or go to the crossword, crossroads, and ask about the ancient ways. We need to go to the crossroads of life, the great intersections of life, where God's Word confronts us with what we want to do or what man says is best to do. And we need to ask, what are the ancient paths? How would God have us walk through the various decisions that are before us as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a community? What does God's Word say? And there needs to be a certain curiosity about it. We need to ask, question, what does God's Word say? The great criticism that Jeremiah had of the, the people of this day was they didn't ask. They just didn't question. The priests and the prophets did not go back and say, well, what did we learn from in the past? They just developed their own way of thinking. So ask about those ancient paths. Where does God lead us? in His Word today. Well, the benefit of, of such commitment to God's Word is rest. 
God promises his people. He continues to plead with them here in the very conclusion. If you follow the ancient paths, if you walk in my ways, you will have rest for your souls. You will have true rest. And is this not what we so much need today? Rest from conflict. Rest from wars. Rest from all kinds of troubles in our hearts and minds. Rest from the burden of sin. That rest, that peace comes when we follow the ancient paths. Jesus called out to his people in his day and said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the one who gives us relief from our sins, brings us peace with God, so that no matter what we face in this life, we go forward with peace and with confidence. Well, let me conclude with this. The, the passage finishes after a reminder once more of the, the judgment to come, the army from the north, the great distress it would cause. He concludes with this great image of the one who tests the metals. One who gathers various ores and has a refiner's fire heated up and lead is mixed in with the ore so that it would uh, take out all the alloys and hopefully leave behind the silver or the gold that was there in the ore. But as the smelting process went on for God's people, the end result was there was no silver, there was no gold. Only the alloys, maybe some iron, some bronze, and, and, and other things, but nothing of real value. God puts his people through tests. He challenges us in the many circumstances of life to see what we are made of. How will you stand that test? Will there be found in you a heart of faith? heart that trusts in the Lord. James reminded his people that they should consider it all joy when you encounter many trials because the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith brings great reward. God looks for a heart of gold, a heart that trusts in him. And through Jesus, through the transforming power of the Spirit, through the work of God's Word dwelling within us, we can be those people of faith. People that stand up in a dark world. In conclusion, we saw that literally this week when a gunman entered a community college in Oregon. And he asked some of the students who, to say what their faith was. And he asked all the Christians to stand up. And then he said... I have good news for you. In a couple seconds, you're going to see the God you believed in. And he went through and shot each of those students, murdering them. When someone asks you, do you believe in Jesus? Are you a Christian? Are you prepared to stand up? The Lord Jesus tests the heart. In the various circumstances of life, whether they're as dramatic as that or just the various everyday decisions we need to be making, we're asked the question, are you a Christian? Will you stand up and walk in the ways that God has provided or go the way of the world? Jesus is the great assayer of the souls of men. He will be the final judge. And he will examine all men and nations with that same penetrating eye. The prophet Malachi at the end of the Old Testament speaks of his coming messenger of the covenant who will refine his people and examine them, searching them out. Will he find faith in your heart? Will he find you to be one who has walked in the ancient ways, 
who's loved the Word of God and has committed himself to following Jesus, even if it means across a narrow ravine, along a path that you can't see below. Follow Jesus, trust in His Word, and He'll bring you safely through it all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that your word would minister to our hearts. We pray that your spirit would examine our hearts and show us whether we are indeed among your people, whether we truly have faith in Jesus and in him alone. And help us, O oh Lord, to trust in you, to walk by faith, even when we do not see a bottom in front of us, when we do not see the path on which we trod. May we trust in your word and know your faithfulness I know that you will bring us through the valley of the shadow of death. We ask for your blessings on us in Jesus' name. Amen.